Welcome to the Twelfth House Podcast. Hello, hello. This is our second in our little three-part series talking about what is wellness. Looking at the past, present, and future of wellness and well-being. A light subject. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little retrospective. <laughs> something, something we've been thinking about, we've been, I don't know, percolating on for the last half a year. Yes. <laughs> and time. And longer than that. You know, I got into wellness basically because I got into fitness. I got into wellness kind of because I had epilepsy and I needed to like not die from having a seizure in my sleep. But I really got into wellness when I started like going to yoga and then started running and then started teaching fitness. And that was like my gateway drug. Mm -hmm. What about you? Mine was having a lot of digestive issues. I was always pretty active in sports. I think in general I ate pretty healthy, but I wasn't conscious of it or preoccupied with it. Yeah. But as soon as I started having digestive issues, I started to just learn about different aspects of nutrition and I started to cook and that was kind of all in high school. And then I I went into my own world of <laughs> wellness discovery to yeah. my family's chagrin at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will say my foray into fitness and eating and all that stuff was definitely from like a very disordered place. Like yeah. that was the, the root. But eventually it like grew into something a little bit more balanced. And I think that's a lot of people's entry point into the wellness world is like dieting. Dieting and this idea that I can solve my problems through this new practice. Yes. Or if I look different, if my body looks different, then I will be happier, feel happier, be healthier. Especially in this culture Mm -hmm. that is promoting that constantly. Absolutely. Especially in the last couple of years where we've kind of, well, now it's coming back, unfortunately, I think with like Kim Kardashian. Have you seen, I don't like to comment on women's bodies too, anyone's body too often, but Kim Kardashian has lost a ton of weight. Mm. (laughs) And we had this moment in time, like in the early aughts when heroin and anorexic chic mm-hmm. was the look Waif. yep Waif. yep the 90s waif. nicole richie mm-hmm. paris hilton lindsey lohan etc mm-hmm. and then like healthy quote-unquote healthy meaning muscular fit six-pack ripped arms got back and like got popular came into vogue and i think people really started to associate physical fitness with being healthy and well Mm-hmm. Like being muscular and strong with being really, with being well. And I think we sort of cycled out of that as the like parameter yeah. of wellness, wellness yeah. and well being. But fitness has been sort of like front of mind, top of mind for such a long time, especially for women mm-hmm. when it comes to well being. Been the pri- thing that we were allowed to prioritize for patriarchal beauty standard reasons, right? So we wanted to talk to Danielle Friedman, who wrote a truly incredible book called Let's Get Physical, How Women Discovered Exercise and Reshaped the World. She does a really amazing job tracing the historical beginnings of exercise in North America. And she touches on so many different complicated aspects of the wellness industry that are still present in how we relate to physical exercise today. And also the social and societal implications of like sort of glorifying fitness, what fitness means to us, why we exercise and sort of our mm, impetus to exercise, maybe at first to lose weight. Now, maybe the, what SoulCycle and Peloton say is to feel better about yourself or to Mm -hmm. feel good, to come back to yourself as a form of self-care, as a way to treat yourself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) To self-actualize and ascend. (laughs) Is really part of the premise. Right. Or to yeah. to clear your mind, right? Yeah. Like to just do a practice. Yeah. Just put one foot in front of another. Which is also true. Like All of the above. Yeah. To have fun. To yeah. feel good. To stay healthy. Whatever that might mean. However mm-hmm. we want to describe that. But also, obviously, it's a fraught conversation because... Mm-hmm exercise is always going to sort of teeter on that line of like diet culture, patriarchal beauty standards. And is this something that we actually need to do? It's like we didn't really start exercising until not that long ago. People weren't like, I'm going to go for a jog in like Renaissance Europe. (laughs) No, people were engaged in much more consistent labor. Mm -hmm. And eating differently and moving their bodies differently. And not in the knowledge worker era where we're glued to our computers (laughs) and they weren't going to the box their their normal their regular old crossfit box to do some muscle ups yeah (laughs) yeah and 
why we wanted to talk to her and why we thought this conversation was interesting because it is really fascinating to understand how did we get here? Yeah, the and, evolution. Yeah, and because she's a great researcher and writer she's very nuanced in her take none of this is good nor bad it's just for you to decide of how you want to engage with fitness in your own life and also just understanding the complexities of how we still relate to it absolutely anyone who is living in a body that experiences marginalization right. i think especially now mm -hmm. when like bodily autonomy is being questioned from every side mm -hmm. and threatened from every side exercise can feel like a form of personal resistance absolutely and is that futile <laughs> well also you gotta take care of your health you gotta you because gotta do the government it. definitely will not yes no totally another great point that we talk about in this episode so danielle's really really smart and i think you're gonna like this interview a lot and hopefully it'll give you something to chew on about your relationship to fitness and wellness and your body your physical form Danielle, from your perspective, this explosion of the female empowered exercise movement mm -hmm. and how many fitness pioneers are really, they're women, how does that help us carve out independence and agency? And does it have to only be in the realm of wellness, basically? Is it almost like wellness is the only appropriate place for us to begin to gain power in some element? So I can't help but think about that question from a historical perspective because that's where my head has been for the past several years. So I kind of want to go back to the birth of the contemporary fitness industry in the 1950s and the explosion of the industry in the 1970s. And part of what I think was so significant about the rise of women's fitness in that era was that for so much of the 20th century, women's bodies like existed for others, to serve others, to give birth to others. Women existed in a subservient position to men. And so fitness, even though obviously there was an element of shaping your body to please, in most cases it was a man, it allowed women, many for the first time, to feel a sense of ownership and agency over their bodies and their physicality and to appreciate what their fully grown adult bodies could do. Many women I interviewed talked about how they were very active as girls. Some, some described themselves as tomboys or they just, they just loved running around. But once they hit puberty, puberty, they were really basically encouraged to kind of be ladylike, which meant to, to always be in control of their physicality. Many, many women through aerobics, through running, through, in some cases, even boutique fitness, began to feel a kind of strength that they hadn't felt before. And so as I write in the book, strength begets strength. And so that feeling often translated to other parts of their life, that feeling of being competent, physically competent and competent. I love, there's a quote from Judy Shepard Missit, who created Jazzercise, where she says the women who came to her classes weren't necessarily changing the world, but they were changing their world. And so I was interested in looking at how when when enough women feel like they have that sense of agency over their world, that can create change on a broader level. So it can, can actually change the world over time. But you're right that this topic is so layered and complicated and wellness has been deemed one of the acceptable spaces for women to attempt to to, to seek self-care. And you can look at the rise of women's fitness as an outgrowth of beauty culture and beauty salons and other cosmetic spaces and, and it just being sort of a more rigorous path to beauty as opposed to just sitting in a hairdresser's chair. So I think that women's fitness has the potential to, and I this word gets way overused, but I think to empower women on an individual level but it's not black and white. It, it's not always the case. And often, too often throughout history, we've had to kind of navigate through really treacherous, toxic terrain to get to that point of, of feeling good. Do you think that the sort of like foundational groundwork that was laid in from the 50s through the 70s and into the 90s, I would say, with women really, this is a strong word, dominating fitness in a way, kind of set 
them up, set us up, set women up to, to sort of be at the forefront of the wellness industry as it was created from 2009 until present. Yes, I focused in on women in my book, but that's not to say there weren't many, many male purveyors of fitness and even of women's fitness. Jack LaLanne in the 1950s, 60s and beyond, he was not only bringing fitness to the masses through his TV show, but he had supplements. He had his own line of bread. He had, yeah, (laughs) juices. and, And so it wasn't only women. I mean, this kind of, I think, gets right to the heart of, in my opinion, why so many women are drawn to wellness culture. But when you think about what women's bodies are often subjected to and what women go through, whether in terms of reproductive health, childbirth, being more vulnerable to sexual violence and assault, it makes sense to me that women, that there would be an urgency behind women seeking out ways to feel strong and safe and good and mentally healthy. To kind of take it a little bit further on the mental health aspect, what do you think about the line of like fitness as the new church for a lot Mm -hmm. of women, especially as we moved into a more secular society Mm -hmm. where we have over the decades that you also trace in your book? How do you think that relates to how we understand mental health and community and spirituality as it all kind of relates to women's fitness and the marketing of it? Yeah, so there's definitely two parallel trends, whereas participation in organized religion and belief has gone down, participation in fitness has, at least among certain segments of the population, gone up. And I think that when we talk about fitness being the new church or studios being these places of worship, it's often, it is often from kind of a cynical point of view and Mm. from like a cult-like point of view. But I think, I mean, there are, I think there are a lot of really valid reasons why Americans have come to be more skeptical of organized religion. And so I think seeking wellness through exercise isn't necessarily a bad alternative. I think that people are really kind of desperate for for community, for feeling connected to a larger purpose, for for guidance in how to in how to live their lives and feel good. And if you remove all of the the trappings of like boutique fitness culture and luxury fitness culture, Exercise just on a biochemical level has been shown to increase feelings of those exact, those exact things. So feelings of, of connection, of social bonding, of a greater purpose in life. So mm-hmm. I think the tricky part is when the leaders, the, the gurus start to maybe abuse their power. So I think I always just believe that it's a good idea to do a kind of gut check with yourself if you find yourself really drawn to a workout just to ensure that it makes you feel good both when you're doing it, when you're not doing it, when you talk about it, and it's actually benefiting your mental health. When you said that, it reminded me that so often when we're drawn to a specific workout or we get obsessed, it's often in a time of like not moral duress, but like emotional duress, like, Mm -hmm. oh, I'm Mm -hmm. going through a breakup. And so I threw Mm -hmm. myself into my Mm -hmm. workouts or Mm -hmm. I'm in a grief process. And that's that's so similar to religion and spirituality in a lot of ways. When we're having a crisis in our lives, we throw ourselves into something we can believe in that, I mean, like, I remember when SoulCycle was really, really at at its top, the Peloton of its time, you might say. And Mm -hmm. people were like, it's a spiritual experience. It's like, Mm -hmm. they would say, it's like going to church. Mm -hmm. I go to Sunday service Mm -hmm. at Mm SoulCycle. And I wonder, Danielle, like, I think there are so many connections between sort of worshiping together, (laughs) worshiping with sweat and worshiping at a house of worship like Mm -hmm. a church. But Mm -hmm. I'm also kind of struck by the purity culture and the almost like moral and ethical underpinnings of both Mm -hmm. the fitness industry and organized religion. When Mm -hmm. we talk about like sweating out the toxins or like burning off like the bad calories, the bad thing that you ate, like almost like paying penance in a way Mm -hmm. for your sins Mm -hmm. by flagellating yourself on the Stairmaster. What do you think about that? 
there's that horrible saying that like sweat is fat crying and that's like the, sad, the saddest <laughs> oh my God. concept to me. Pinterest quote. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Hashtag fitspo. Yeah. Pinterest disorder. Let's, uh, sorry, let's just call it what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So going back many, many decades, thinness has long been linked to virtue. And there is this kind of Christian puritanical element to it. The it's, ultimate fitspo. Exactly. The original. (laughs) If you think about it, like if gluttony is a sin, then Mm self-discipline and sacrifice is a virtue. And so Mm -hmm. these associations are just baked into our culture. They have been for a long, long time. And I mean, they were interpreted, that idea was interpreted differently throughout history, but, but certainly over the past 150 years, it's been interpreted in a more literal way with, with, thinness being held up as close to godliness. And so what what began to happen, though, was in the 1970s and 1980s, this idea was kind of extended beyond just thinness to fitness. And the idea that a fit body was a virtuous body and a, and a moral body really took hold on a cultural level. And there's also sort of these ideas of religion and American puritanism and purity are all intertwined because sloth is also a sin. And so Mm -hmm. it was sort of a natural, it wasn't hard for many Americans to wrap their heads around this idea that, okay, if sloth is a sin then working, working hard forever, working to quote, improve ourselves, our bodies must be a good thing. And Of course, in isolation, if someone wants to work on their body, fine. But then it became the inverse also was held up to be true. So if a fit body is a worthy body, then what is an what is an unfit body? Mm -hmm. And really, especially in the 80s, if you weren't constantly striving for that not only thin but toned and really Jane Fonda-esque physique, you were sent the message that you were not as worthy and your body was devalued. And during that time, we saw rampant fat shaming, flab shaming. There was a real message to kind of get in line. And so I think once that seed was planted, it's been very hard to kind of uproot. Mm -hmm. And I think that it has been a pretty destructive force, especially when the direction in which we've been encouraged to better ourselves is is a very narrow one, a very narrow, white, heteronormative ideal. The section in your book where you're talking about women's entrance into running overall Mm -hmm. and what black women faced when Mm -hmm. they were presented with this new trend of, well, it's not actually safe for me to go running in the same Mm -hmm. way that it is for white women. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts more on the morality and virtue side of exercise as that extends into wealth as wellness, because ultimately to have the time to work out and to feel safe to work out in the ways that are available to you is a privilege and still is a privilege when you think about time or the time to even rest and recover from exercise, let alone have the time to go and exercise outside of your job. You're absolutely right. And that's, I mean, one of the reasons why when I, when I hear people shame people for not looking a certain way or for not working out or whatever, it's just like, it's one of my, it just infuriates me because there are so many, there is so much structural systemic inequity and so many barriers to people just making movement, having a part of their, their everyday life. Like you said, having the time, the means and the safe space to move around are all, are all privileges. And often when we look at the rate of participation in this country, which I think it's something like less than 40% of people meet the daily recommended amount of mm-hmm. physical activity. It's so easy to be like, oh, Americans are so lazy. I don't, I don't think that's it. I think about myself and I feel like I am so fortunate and so privileged and I theoretically should be able to make time to exercise every day. I mean, I literally just wrote a whole book about (laughs) celebrating exercise. And I find it challenging as the mother of of one young child with a job. And there are so many hidden barriers to exercise in our culture. And there have long been. There are 
more and more groups that are working to increase access and an opportunity and to transform fitness from a privilege into a right. And a lot of that, I think it's a problem that has not been sort of figured out yet. And it's just one of the many areas in which our country's healthcare and the way in which we support each other is lacking. But I do think that there's something to the idea of expanding the way we think of fitness and fitness culture to be well beyond the kind of luxury, shiny, boutique world that many of us associate with fitness and to just be about finding ways to incorporate movement and moving in a way that feels good into our everyday lives. Absolutely. As you were talking about the structural inequities that prevent people from exercise, I was thinking about how much it feels like COVID has really accelerated that awareness that mm-hmm. in order for exercise to be something that is accessible, it it can't be something that we constantly have to go out of our way to mm-hmm. do mm-hmm. and needs to be much more integrated into our lifestyle and our culture and our society. And even as you mentioned with childcare, you mm-hmm. said, I have a daughter and a job. It's like, well, you have two jobs. And yeah. so even thinking about what COVID has done for families in terms of awareness of how this is not an in- individual issue, this is a societal issue that needs to be changed at the systemic level. I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts on that are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would be curious to see if there is any research on how it has shifted sort of the public's perception on what needs to happen on a on a societal level on that scale. But I do know that just anecdotally from talking to individual people, I think the experience of being confined to our homes has given a lot of people a new appreciation just for for movement and for using our bodies in the most sort of fundamental way. As well as, I mean, just for the ability to go outside and breathe fresh air, take a deep breath in and out. I I have sort of heard like the early sort of whispers of a maybe return sort of back to basics, renewed embrace of a less maybe punishing mentality toward exercise and toward fitness. I, I'm encouraged by, I've seen a number of headlines about like the beauty of walking <laughs> and which has, walking has sort of like had its moments in fitness history, but, but for the most part, it's been sort of like written off as not real exercise. Well, it's a lot healthier to take a 20 minute walk around the block than to, to do nothing. If you have that, that time and space. So I think there's been this kind of great reevaluating and reprioritizing during this time, and it is beginning to affect the way we see fitness. My friend and fellow fitness historian Natalia Melman Petrozella just wrote a piece for the Washington Post about how the the long held idea that like New Year's is a time to return to the gym and and New Year New You it has really changed th- through the pandemic, and this year gyms were for for a variety of reasons but but gyms were empty and there wasn't necessarily like evidence that people were making up for it by <laughs> going hard at home so yeah i think i think it's still unfolding the pandemic has also encouraged some people to try to try new kinds of workouts and to go outside of their comfort zone because they've had access more access to working out at home they're not embarrassed by making a fool of themselves in front of other people. <laughs> but it's been, yeah, my my hope is that, and the last sort of piece of this puzzle is that because we are moving more in isolation, like there, that it will maybe lead to a shift of toward movement of working out for ourselves, of, mm-hmm. of moving in ways that make us, that are truly just about sort of pleasing and benefiting ourselves and, and not anybody else. Yeah, we did a trend piece a couple months ago and low impact fitness is the number one thing basically like no cardio (laughs) yeah (laughs) horizontal fitness if possible yeah (laughs) Yeah. they're like stretching in bed (laughs) we we often joke about we're both on class pass and Mm -hmm. like oh if you go sit in the sauna that's basically a workout exactly restorative yoga just letting exactly like come on that's, that's part of it but all jokes aside the siloed wellness industry, the siloed fitness industry, we're seeing those sort of distinctions begin to disintegrate. Mm. And 
fitness or wellness is becoming part Mm -hmm. of living and being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's less, oh, I have to go schedule this workout, sort of like take off my personhood and like go do this very separate thing. And it's more integrated and holistic in our lives. And as a result, we think that we're going to see less of a distinction of wellness and more just this is a lifestyle, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is, I guess, what we've been saying about exercise mm-hmm. and diet forever. But I, I think we're, that's really reflected in the way that the world is moving. And I think COVID has had a hu- we think COVID has had a huge role in that. How do you think that that will impact? Like we, you kind of have touched on it, but how do you think that might impact how we think of fitness and exercise in the future? Yeah, I'm encouraged to hear that you're sort of observing similar trends because that's very much in line with what I've been hearing too. There's a major name in fitness that shall remain nameless right now that has a motto of it's not fitness, it's life. And while I know that that on a on an intellectual level, I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah, but there's something about the way that that branding and that motto is presented that always kind of like makes me feel just a little bit icky because it's sort of like there is that implicit judgment of if you're not engaging in fitness, you're wasting your life, (laughs) like (laughs) screaming at me of how important it is. And like, I don't need anybody. I don't do well when people are screaming at me. And I, I think we're also, as a culture, just experiencing this collective burnout and women especially are just are just exhausted. And so I think that because our, our we're kind of so many of us are sort of worn down and our reserves are worn out that that we're just many women are just seeking out ways big and small to incorporate true self-care into mm-hmm. their lives. And and part of it's I think a practical logistical thing like we don't always have an hour and a half if you count commuting time to, or, yeah. Or, or yeah and showering and to go to a, a separate space to exercise even carving out like 45 solid minutes of a day at home can be could be tricky so I think it makes sense that a sort of response to that would be just sort of seeking ways that are a little bit more fluid and organic integrating movement that is more organic into our daily lives. I think the social markers that have long stood for success are starting to be really questioned. And there is a move, the the kind of millennial mentality that we should always be optimizing is really being questioned. And there is a new cultural kind of encouragement for taking care of ourselves and not mm-hmm. and not sacrificing ourselves to work whether it's at the office or at a gym, which is not to say for me, I know when I'm going through a period maybe where I feel like other parts of my life are challenging or I feel I don't feel as in control of certain aspects of my life. Training for a race can be really uplifting and and provide me with the sense of pride that I feel like might be missing in other parts of my life. So Everyone sort of has to seek out what works for them individually, but the the idea that there's a cultural imperative to always be working, working, working on ourselves and on our bodies is, I think, starting to be. Yeah, this is totally tangential, but I also wonder with the with burnout, with hustle culture, and especially with our. Are you millennial, Danielle? I'm like the most elder millennial, <laughs> but I technically am. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we're, we're all millennials here. And I think that our generation, our age, like really mm-hmm. was sort of the rocket ship behind the wellness industry taking off again. And what an interesting, just like looking at it from a high level, we went through the recession when we were of yes. the time when we should be building our careers. So we were set back and it was like hustle because you can make up for lost time. You can make up for lost mm-hmm. time if you just work harder. And so often that I feel like that's a similar sort of tune that happens in fitness. Well, if you just like work out harder, do two a days, cut out all carbs, you're going to, don't worry, you can make up for lost time. You can totally lose mm-hmm. the weight in, before mm-hmm. the thing you need to do. And, and now in the pandemic, we've literally lost time to have these major life milestones. Yeah. It's like getting married or having a child yeah. or traveling the world in the time when you, when you can, because you don't have mm-hmm. a family or you don't have mm-hmm. a, in like this incredible career that's holding Mm -hmm. you down, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no way to speed that up. There's no way to make up for that lost time. Mm. And I wonder if 
something like sort of in an existential way, if something like exercising every day feels like almost for not, it's like, oh, I want to reclaim my time. <laughs> like, exactly. I, I don't, that's kind of like a word salad, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot, this idea of time and what we can control and can't control. Yeah, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think I think it also makes sense that millennials who did live through the recession and who are saddled with so much debt and who are inheriting a world that looks very different than the world that they grew up in. Like I get how going to the gym, going to a class, tracking your your heart rate, your progress, all of these more these sort of tangible markers of improvement can feel comforting. It can feel like a way of exerting control over your life. But you can kind of I don't know. Many people can only do that for so long before they just start to question the premise. And I mean, also millennials are getting older and (laughs) we can't all work out at the same pace as we as we once did. You can't run Um, on on the berries tread at at an 11 anymore. We're just our knees can't take it. Yeah, not that I ever could, but (laughs) but I definitely can't now. I think too many people go flying off the treadmill at Barry's boot camp to ever try and go full speed. (laughs) I'm just too shy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Those dark rooms. I have a little bit of a off the cuff question, kind of related to where we're at with spending more time in our screens during the pandemic and the explosion of just social media and new technology. And we talk about like face tuning and body tuning Mm. and all of these filters you hear a lot about in the beauty industry that all of these cosmetic surgeons are presented with these images that are completely manufactured by a filter and women are asking to change Mm -hmm. their bodies to look like that. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a two-part question. One, part of me thinks this isn't new because there were always magazines that were, you talk about Jane Fonda's book where she's extolling these virtues of loving your body and accepting your body. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, all the women in her book are very much one type of very thin Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. body that is often genetic or a result of, in her case, her like longstanding body dysmorphia Mm -hmm. and anorexic Mm -hmm. issues. So Mm -hmm. do you think it's just evolved and it's kind of similar messages or how do you think it's evolved and, and how do you see that affecting our relationship to exercise today? I think that aspect of social media is very toxic for girls and women. And there have been many, many studies looking at how comparing ourselves to others, particularly on social media, has a negative effect on self-esteem. I do think one thing that has changed since like Jane Fonda's era or some of the other eras I, I write about in the book is that despite that sort of abyss of face tuned <laughs> images on social media there there is also more body diversity and representation the 50s 60s 70s 80s and even more recently it was this sort of one directional conversation between women's magazines pop culture cultural ideal deals advertisers and women women were kind of told how to look and they they tried to meet those ideals whereas now you can you can curate your instagram and this is not to diminish the harm that those accounts do but there is very real pushback against that culture it's a two-way conversation now and i think that is just beginning to kind of move the needle on how we talk about women's bodies what we think of as a fit body and the cultural urgency for more body diversity but i think despite everything i know through my research and everything i've experienced in my life if i spend like five minutes scrolling through pictures of (laughs) women whose bodies look very different from mine who hold up these kind of unrealistic ideals I start to feel bad about myself and so Mm -hmm. and I'm I've done decades of sort of work to get to a place of self-acceptance and so I hope that in the next chapter of this conversation those accounts are sort of and that whole approach is sort of de-glorified Yeah. It's nice to also anchor and remember that there is progress being made and there is change being made. Even when you just look at whether you're shopping online and 
Mm-hmm. You see actually different bodies wearing the clothing, not just yes. sample size or whatever. It's nice to remember that. I think on a personal level, sometimes you just feel like, oh, it's not fast enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And I always feel a little like Pollyanna-ish when I talk about mm-hmm. the progress. But having been immersed in this history for the past five years, like I do think it's important to acknowledge the people who are fighting, the people mm-hmm. who are working really hard to change things and who are starting to make an impact. It's not like they're calling it a day, but it's, yeah. but there is very slowly, I think, starting to be some progress in terms of how we think about women's bodily priorities. Especially, I think yeah. the body neutrality movement is so interesting to keep an mm-hmm. eye on because mm-hmm. it's growing so quickly. And yes. there are some really incredible people who are at the forefront of that who work yeah. in fitness and wellness. And like, yeah. I think that that dichotomy is so interesting to me. Mm-hmm. There's so much like juiciness there and mm-hmm. so much to climb through. And I think that mm-hmm. the grappling of like, yeah, I do want to be neutral about my body. I don't want to like a fat day, quote unquote, mm-hmm. whatever, to like ruin my, to actually mm-hmm. wreak havoc on my emotional state for the rest mm-hmm. of the day mm-hmm. and I also feel good when my body feels good so like right. how do I make those two things make sense together not put mm-hmm. so much impetus on mm-hmm. like how my body looks and feels mm-hmm. but also know that it, it does impact me in a way and I think that that's uncharted territory that we're all kind of like sort of trying to figure out together I agree and I think from a like a feminist angle too it's very tricky I've had a lot of sort of hushed conversations with other feminist writers recently about sort of reconciling our our intellectual views about beauty and appearance and women's bodies with how we feel personally about our size and the way we mm-hmm. present ourselves to the world. And I don't think anyone really has the answers yet, but, but we're, we're asking, I think people are starting to ask the right question. And we have wonderful leaders like you who are pointing out, oh. like pointing out the past, but really like what you're doing as a feminist act, because you're a historian of like a women's movement. Mm-hmm. And I would say like mm-hmm. wellness in general has sort of been like snubbed as like a yes. sort of silly woman's yes. thing. Right. But it has huge anthropological and societal implications. And it tells us so much about mm-hmm. what's going on from a gender perspective in history. So thank you for the work that you do. It's really important. Thank you for inviting me on today. This has been so much fun. (laughs) Okay, hope you enjoyed that episode. And this is not a closed loop discussion. We'd love to hear what you think. Mm -hmm. And we'd love to hear from you, period, uh, around the 12th house. So you can leave a review at Apple Podcasts, five stars. We would appreciate that. (laughs) (laughs) If you have feedback for us, we always love to hear it. If you're like, I kind of... I like you, but not that much. We'd love to hear it in an email. Yeah, let us know. What do you want send, more of? Send us a note. We aim to please invite interesting conversations, pull the curtain back around wellness, well-being, and all of the above. Thanks for joining us today. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. The Twelfth House is produced by Wallace Miller Blanchard. Our theme music is made by Nathan McKay. And our wonderful editing is done by Softer Sound Studios, who you can find more information about in our show notes.